Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, where we discuss classical and modern jurisprudence. Today's episode features Joshua Kleinfeld, professor of law at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. Professor Kleinfeld teaches and writes in legal and political philosophy, legislations and statutory interpretation, and criminal law and procedure. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Professor Kleinfeld, what kind of questions does jurisprudence try to answer? Why do these questions matter to lawyers? Do jurisprudential questions have any practical legal implications? One of the questions that have, has inspired jurisprudence over time is what is the nature of law? What kind of a thing is this distinctive entity called law and what are its contingent features and its truly necessary features? In that sense, the philosophy of law is related to oh, the philosophy of music or the philosophy of art or the philosophy of science or the philosophy of democracy. In any case, in, in all cases, what's going on is that philosophically minded people are looking at some um, social enterprise or artifact of human creation and saying, what are its uh, essential or defining features? What are its necessary and sufficient conditions? And in so doing, are examining something we all have a sort of intuitive understanding of through experience and trying to give it more philosophical definition, and in particular to separate out its essential and inessential elements. Within the what is the nature of law conversation, one very important strand has been the relationship between law and morality. And those two questions have become intermingled, the nature of law with the relationship of law and morality. I think it's because both law and morality are normative. Both of them issue in imperatives of an ought nature. One ought to do this. One is bound to do that. And so they are the two great normative systems giving order to social life. And so it's natural to ask about the relationship between these two great um, forms of normative order. Everyone consents that they are connected to each other. Everyone consents that they are separate from each other. And everyone wonders what the nature of the connection is. In particular, is it contingent or is it necessary? I think there are other interesting facets of jurisprudence of even greater personal interest to me, as a matter of fact. One of them is trying to give what we might call synthetic theoretical accounts of different departments of law. So what I have in mind here is things like the corrective justice tradition in tort law, which looks at the way tort law works, the victim, accuser, uh, confronting an alleged injurer, alleging some private wrong and demanding uh, compensation in response. And they try to give a synthetic account where they say, this is about minimizing the cost of accidents, or this is about doing corrective justice, upholding corrective justice, or this is about civil recourse. And you get these comprehensive, synthetic, theoretical accounts of what a department of law is all about, what its centering aims are. You see the same thing with retributive justice theory in criminal law, or my own creation, reconstructivism in criminal law, um, which holds that the special work of criminal law is to reconstruct a violated social order in the wake of some act of wrongdoing. Uh, you see the same thing in the contract as promise tradition, which tries to say that contract is the legal effectuation of the promise principle, the idea that we're bound to each other as free individuals by our capacity to make promises to one another. So those accounts of a uh, department of law, which I find personally extremely interesting, I've given a label to those that form of philosophy of law. I call it specific jurisprudence. It's a bit of a play on words. Austin famously called general jurisprudence this question of the nature of law. He distinguished it from particular jurisprudence, which are the laws that prevail in any particular uh, state or nation. Um, so at that time, it was very common to use the word jurisprudence to refer to the laws of England, the jurisprudence of England. We still talk that way, the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court on criminal procedure or something like that. Uh, so it, it referred to particular areas of 
legal doctrine. So to distinguish general jurisprudence from particular jurisprudence, he made this distinction. I'm plain with that distinction. General jurisprudence is the nature of law as such. Specific jurisprudence is the nature of a department of law. Third facet of jurisprudence that I think is, you know, interesting and worth talking about. There are a lot of specific philosophical questions that law presents. For example, in tort law and criminal law and many other areas, issues of causation become pressing. What does it mean for someone to be causally responsible for some harm in the world? Uh, how can you trace out those lines of causation? How can you distinguish, let's say that someone bursts into this studio right now and shoots me? Well, you could say that the shooter is the cause. That's very natural, right, of my death. But you could also say that your invitation to me to speak to in this studio is the cause of my death. After all, but for your invitation for me to be in this studio today, I would not have been shot by that particular shooter. You could also say my parents having me as their child is the cause. In fact, causal chains are, are complicated and infinite. And so making sense of causation, which is a classic topic in philosophy, is also an important topic in law. Or think about discrimination law. We talk about animus. What is animus? Think about the law of religion. We have a guarantee in our Constitution that members of religious groups are entitled to the free exercise of religion, and the state is not permitted to establish a religion. But what is a religion? Is it different from a cult? Is it different from an organized belief system? Like everybody has their worldview. Is that different from a religion? So all of these philosophical topics that arise in the law and one office of jurisprudence, one task of jurisprudence is to address them and try to shed light on them in order to illuminate the world and to, and to advance the work of our lawyers and courts. Finally, and to my mind, very importantly, every one of us as a human being is tasked with the question of how we should live our lives. For lawyers, that question arises as it does for everyone else. Uh, how should I live my life as a lawyer? What constitutes a good life? What would be true happiness or fulfillment? What would be flourishing? Or as the ancients put it, what would be the eudaimonia, the, the flourishing of the, in the life of a lawyer? And so these questions of how to live a good life are, to my mind, jurisprudential questions as well. In a certain sense, they're ethical questions. They're not legal ethics in the sense of, do I have a conflict of interest? They're legal ethics in the sense of, is the life of a lawyer a good life, or how can I make choices to make it a good life? Uh, those questions, to me, are part of the, the universe of jurisprudence as well. The natural law tradition of jurisprudence definitely addresses those types of ethical questions. For over a thousand years, the natural law perspective was the only type of jurisprudence. Is it still relevant today? How did it lose dominance? Here's the amazing thing about that. The natural law tradition dominated Western legal history from the Greco-Roman area before Christianity through the 18th century when the United States was founded with explicitly natural law language, and right into the early 19th century, when Blackstone wrote. And then it collapsed like a skyscraper collapsing in on itself. And right away, in a matter of decades, a legal philosophy which had long been rejected, legal positivism became dominant in the English-speaking world, starting with England, spreading quickly to the United States. Interestingly, again, on the continent as well, in Germany and France and elsewhere, influenced by totally different thinkers than the ones who shaped the Anglo-American tradition, inspired by people like Kelsen rather than people like Austin and Hart. So what are we to make of a 2,000-plus-year-old tradition falling over in a few decades on, in multiple countries at the same time because of multiple different thinkers. And I think it is very implausible that someone wrote something that just convinced the world to change its mind. Social conditions changed that made legal positivism formally implausible and then become plausible. So what are those social conditions? I think one of them is, as Nietzsche put it, the death of God. 
the religious understanding of the world where it made sense to think that there is a moral order inscribed in the world by God to which human law must correspond simply came to seem implausible in secular society. But I don't think that's the only factor. I think an important strand of the natural law tradition was not religious at all. It was secular. It was based on ideas about the proper order of human society, ideas that Aristotle developed. They're known as teleological ideas about the place of law in fostering a community of flourishing. And I think those teleological ideas came to seem implausible because of modern science. And I think above all, if there's one factor more important than any other, it's the rise of the modern state. At the very foundation of positivism is a picture which is more compelling than any argument. The picture is that the law is a kind of edict of a lawgiver, an edict of the state. But most law over most time was not an edict of the state. It was the customs of communities upheld by long-established practice. Indeed, for much of human history, there really wasn't a state as we know it today. There were tribes with a sort of tribal organization. There were communities uh, with uh, their community usages and norms. There were sometimes rulers. I'll tell you an interesting story about this. In the Renaissance, the Italian city-states started issuing these newfangled things called statutes. And the great law professors of the day said, what are these things called statutes? Can they be law? That's not what we mean by law. And they had learned controversies about whether law, which referred to longstanding usage and custom, could be conceptually expanded to include this newfangled thing, the statute. I'll tell you something even weirder about it. When one polis conquered another in war and had its victory parade, they started a practice of carrying one another's statute books through the street as a symbol of their victory over the fallen city. So human history was very, very different before the rise of the modern state with its bureaucratically organized government and its ability to issue edicts backed by the force of the state and called laws. And as that form of government came into daily experience, the natural law picture of law as that which is established by the conscious of the community over time just came to seem implausible. And the positivist picture of law as an edict of government came to seem plausible. So when H.L.A. Hart defines and defends positivism, he doesn't do so explicitly in terms of um, the authority of edicts of the state. He talks about the rule of recognition. He talks about the separation of law and morality. Modern positivists like Scott Shapiro talk about how law's um, validity is based on social facts alone rather than moral facts. But I think there is something that can only be seen through the lens of history, uh, which is importantly true about legal positivism, and it is the relationship to the rise of the modern state and the death of God. Let's talk more about the lens of history as a way to understand ideas. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? What types of historical events do you discuss in class? My approach is historical, much more historical than the typical jurisprudence class, which focuses on conceptual analysis. And the reason for that is that my fundamental conviction is that ideas and events are linked. Philosophical ideas are at work throughout most of the great events that have shaped political and legal history for centuries. Think about, for example, the American Revolution. The American Revolution is one of the great events in world history, and it is shaped by ideas about the rights of all human beings, democracy, equality, uh, a whole panoply of Enlightenment ideas about the rights of man and the limits of the state. Or think about the French Revolution just a few years later, which was shaped by just the same set of ideas refigured for the French tradition and for an aristocratic situation more separated from the English tradition. Or think about the Civil War, which uh, was shaped by ideas about human freedom and bondage and the rights of the nation versus the state. Or think about 
the Russian Revolution, which was shaped quite explicitly by Marxist ideas, or the subsequent Cold War, which was a, uh, an ideological confrontation between uh, a liberal capitalist society and a communist one. In every case, ideas are at work in the world. Ideas are shaping events. And specifically in legal history, the New Deal was inflected by ideas about legal realism. Um, the unfolding civil rights revolution that we're still living with today is affected at all points by competing ideas of the meaning of equality. Or the international law tradition, particularly the law of war and the human rights tradition, are shaped by uh, natural law thinking. And so, you know, it's common to hear people challenge philosophy's relevance to law. Why study jurisprudence? Why study philosophy? It's irrelevant. Once the historical perspective comes into view, those challenges to uh, philosophy's relevance come to look Philistine and totally ungrounded in an understanding of political history. If philosophical ideas are at work in the great events in history, then understanding them is part of understanding those great events. I think the light shines in the other direction as well. And so this is actually the more controversial idea. It's the idea that to fully understand the philosophical ideas, you have to see how they are, the shapes they take in the course of, of history. So what is it to understand legal positivism? Well, you have to ask hard questions about what does legal positivism mean for judges and lawyers in practice? What did it mean in, uh, among the judges of the Third Reich? What did it mean at Nuremberg? What does natural law mean? You have to look at the way natural law actually manifested in the course of human history. So this approach to the relationship between philosophy and history or ideas and events is explicitly Hegelian. Hegel said that philosophy is concerned with what he called ideas rather than with what he called mere concepts because a concept is a purely mental thing or purely noumenal thing while an idea, and this is his language, is the concept together with its actualization. A concept is actualized in a form of life or in an event or in a social practice or in a social institution. And it was Hegel's conviction that to understand the social world is to understand the concepts that are actualized in it. And likewise, to understand the concepts is to see the shape they've taken when they've become ideas, when they've been embodied. And so my favorite quote from Hegel is, the shapes which the concept acquires in the course of its actualization are indispensable to knowledge of the concept itself. So I actually think pure conceptual analysis is inadequate in both directions. Pure conceptual analysis of positivism or natural law or whatever else doesn't tell you enough about the world, and it doesn't tell you enough about positivism or natural law. We have to understand the concept in the abstract, but then see how it is embodied in events in history in order to fully grasp the concept and its meaning. These ideas not only have an impact on historical events, but they also shape how individual people live their lives and practice the legal profession. Let's revisit our first question about why jurisprudence matters for lawyers. Do lawyers and philosophers have anything in common in how they approach these concepts? One thing that comes to mind is that when I was in, I, I went to law school first, and then I went to graduate school in philosophy. And I had a set of friends when I was in law school that were fellow future lawyers. And I had a different set of friends in the philosophy department who were future philosophers. And I, I often wondered, how are they different as people? What are the differences? And um, if I had to put it in a single word, the word would be instrumental. Lawyers are a much more instrumental bunch than philosophers. So with lawyers, they're very, very smart. And they get an idea in their hands and they say, what can I use this idea to do? How can I use it to maybe advance a political cause, maybe advance the cause of justice, change the world in some way, make some cash? Uh, what can I do with this idea that would be useful? The philosophers were less instrumental. They thought that idea is interesting. Uh, it sparks something in me, something in my character, my curiosity, and I'm just going to sit with that idea and reflect on it and try to understand it as completely as I possibly can 
because of a certain joy that comes from being a speculative person. And I guess it comes down to this Aristotelian distinction between the practical life and the speculative life. What Aristotle meant by that, practical comes from a, a root, praktos, which means action in philosophy. And uh, Aristotle was distinguishing a life that is focused on trying to understand the world and the world of trying to accomplish something, to accomplish some action. I think the lawyers um, lean more to the practical and the philosophers more to the speculative side of that practical spec speculative division in Aristotelian philosophy. I want to take your question in another direction as well about the affinities and disaffinities between these two fields. Earlier I talked about how philosophical ideas are, um, affect the sort of great events in political and legal history, the New Deal and the, and the Civil Rights Revolution and the Cold War and all the rest of these big events. I want to talk about something else now. I want to talk about how philosophical ideas event the daily practice of legal argumentation. The kind of thing you do if you work at a law firm, just you go to work on a very typical Tuesday morning, and I submit that philosophical ideas affect the way you write that brief, the way you talk with your colleagues about a case, the way the case itself is shaped. How? If you're a legal positivist, there are certain moves you make in legal argumentation uh, or maybe I should put that differently. It's not just if you personally are a legal positivist. If you are working within a highly positivistic legal culture, what you do when you write legal argumentation is a lot of, say, appealing to authoritative governmental edicts, statutes, regulations, maybe case law, argumentation about which edicts are more authoritative than others. For example, if there are conflicting cases, which one should, uh, is more analogous or more authoritative and should guide discussion in a particular case. The practice of positivistic judging is a practice of authority seeking for support for certain propositions. And of course, anyone who has worked in a firm know we do that every day. That's just part of the practice. But it's not all we do. The practice of of lawyering and judging in a world of either natural law, legal realism, or both, is about making appeals to policy around the edges of those appeals to authority. So you ask questions like, what interpretation of this statute or regulation would make the most sense, would lead to the best consequences? We might say, that interpretation of the statute can't be right because it would have absurd consequences or counterproductive consequences or its consequences would be highly inefficient or would create perverse incentives or indeed would be unjust. And the very form of that kind of argument is an appeal to a legal culture in which we expect our law to ultimately be rational and conduce to societal flourishing. And that kind of argumentation has deep roots, again, in either natural law or legal realism or both. When you look at, you know, if you go to oye.org and listen to people making oral arguments before the Supreme Court, yeah, they invoke authority sometimes, but boy, do they do a lot more than invoke authority. What we actually have is a kind of, should I call it a layer cake, hodgepodge, a, a marbling. We have a marbling of realist elements, natural law elements, and positivistic elements in our traditions of legal argumentation and our culture of legal argumentation. And you see it in the practice of law. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. I like to do something with my students. It's one of my favorite parts of the semester. After we have studied uh, four schools of thought, positive law, natural law, critical legal studies, and legal realism, we have a moot court where they take a real case and they debate it, they argue it, uh, just as lawyers were, would before a court, with me playing the role of mock judge. But there's a part of the assignment, they have to implicitly write arguments from a legal positivistic perspective, or a natural law perspective, or a crit perspective, or a realist perspective. They have to craft arguments where they never can explicitly say what their philosophical school of thought is, but implicitly, they have to craft arguments that reflect that school of thought.
after the exercise, so the point of the exercise is for them to see how these different philosophical positions affect the crafting of legal argument, arguments, affect the craft of legal argumentation, I should say. And afterwards, we spend some time listening to oral arguments before the Supreme Court. And we pause and we say, how would you classify the move that lawyer just made? We listen some more and pause and classify. How would you, how would you think about this? Once you start engaging in that practice, you start seeing philosophical ideas alive in the most ordinary motions to dismiss, the most ordinary briefs on the, in the appellate courts, the most ordinary motions before the trial courts. It's just a part of, it's what we do when we go to work. And you start to see that our daily practices are philosophically inflected. There's two advantages to seeing it. The first is there's a certain joy in seeing it. There's a joy because it stops seeming so dead and routine. You start to see that there are big ideas afoot in the things you do when you go to work in the morning, if you're a lawyer. There's also a power and a freedom that comes from seeing it because you start to see, ah, I have been making exclusively positivistic moves. Now, having seen how these different moves on the chessboard of law work, I can now quite explicitly make a realist move or a critical legal studies move or a natural law move. And a range of, of let's say, argumentative possibilities opens up before your fingertips that weren't necessarily apparent before. And so there's a joy that comes from it, but there's also a freedom from your own presuppositions and a power that comes from it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series on jurisprudence. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content, encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. Thanks for listening. See you in class.